So welcome back. This is going to be screencast number one for chapter 16. And in this screencast, we are going to focus on the idea of evolution, which basically means change over time, and more specifically, the process that occurs that actually allows evolution to happen. And that's called natural selection. Now, we're also going to discuss a person by the name of Charles Darwin. And a lot of his ideas, a lot of his thinking, were the um, thoughts that actually were used to come up with the idea that things actually do change over a long period of time. Now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of combine 16.1 and 16.2 out of your textbook, but a lot of the information we're going to look at is going to come primarily from 16.2. So a lot of the evidence that was collected by Charles Darwin was actually collected during his travels on the HMS Beagle. And these travels actually occurred over a period of about five years. Now all of the evidence that he had collected during those five years helped him to develop his theory of biological evolution. Now evolution simply means to change over a period of time. Now we're not talking about a single individual changing over a period of time. We're actually talking about a species that would change over a period of time. Now, his idea of biological evolution um, was used to explain how modern organisms, in other words, organisms we might see today, actually evolved through the idea of descent from a common ancestor. Now, as he traveled, he had noticed three distinct patterns of biological diversity. Now, the idea of diversity is basically differences. Now, differences that he had noticed in all of the different organisms, both plants and animals, that he had seen during his five years of travel. Now, one thing that he had noticed was that species vary globally. So different yet similar animal species, they inhabited separate but ecologically similar habitats around the globe. So, for example, if you look at um, the birds we have over here on the right-hand side, we have an ostrich, an emu, and we have a rhea. All of these birds actually look very similar to each other. They're flightless birds. They have very large legs, very powerful legs, pretty long necks, and of course these birds can't fly. Now each one of these birds occurs on a different part of the globe. So in other words, they really didn't have any contact with each other. In fact, some of them are separated by pretty significant oceans. But because of the habitat that they um, evolved in, they basically evolved to be very similar to each other. Now the second thing that we looked at, or the second thing that Darwin noticed, was that species do vary locally. So Darwin noticed that different yet related animal species often occupy different habitats within that same local area. Now in the video that I had you watch Darwin's dangerous idea, he had discussed the idea of the finches and how each of the finches in the Galapagos had developed a different type of beak based on their feeding behavior. And so that would be a good example of how species vary locally. You have a very confined habitat, species of finches that are found in that habitat, but because they feed on different things, they have to evolve a little bit different so they can actually um, benefit from the type of food that they have available. Now, the third distinctive pattern that he had noticed was that species actually vary over time. Now what he did is he actually collected many fossils during his five years of travel. And what he had noticed is that um, these fossils, which are simply the preserved remains or traces of ancient organisms, he noticed that some of the fossils of extinct animals looked very similar to um, living animals of that time. So over here you can see an example of an armadillo down here towards the bottom and it looks very similar to a fossilized animal that no longer exists today. So again, kind of lending support to that idea that evolution actually occurs. So if you notice down here towards the bottom it says the evidence suggested that species are not fixed, which means they don't stay the same and that they could actually change by some natural process. And at this point, he really didn't know what that process was. Now, during the time of Darwin, there were also a couple of other scientists that actually helped to kind of stir um, the idea that evolution might occur in natural organisms. And one of those was James Hutton. And actually, the information that they looked at wasn't really based on living organisms. It was based more on the geological processes that occur within the Earth. And so what James Hutton actually recognized was that there was a connection between the many geological processes and earth features like the mountains, the valleys, and the layers that you might find in the earth. He made observations that there were many forces beneath the earth 
that could actually push rock layers upward and actually build many of the mountain ranges that we see today. And then of course those mountain ranges might actually be wore down by rain, wind, heat, and cold. So what we're saying here is that you actually notice there is a change over a period of time based on those processes that you would notice on the planet. So he concluded that the Earth must be more than a few thousand years old, which is, was a, a really strongly held belief back in the 17 and 1800s, because during that time there was a really heavy influence in terms of religion, and of course based on that religion, there was no way that the Earth could be more than a few thousand years old. So Hutton actually introduced the concept of deep time basically stating that in order for these different processes to occur it must take many many years and we're not talking a few thousand we're talking millions of years for these processes to happen another individual by the name of Charles Lyell also had very similar beliefs to Hutton and he felt that the laws of nature are considered constant over a period of time and that anything that happened in the past can be explained by observing all the processes that still occur in the present. And they gave that a special name. They called that uniformitarianism. And if you look over here on the right hand side, we have a very simplistic example of the rock cycle. In other words, these are the processes that actually occur to produce a lot of the geologic features that we notice today. So the idea is that these processes have been occurring actually for millions and millions and millions of years. So Darwin had actually read Lyell's book and he felt that if the earth can change over a long period of time, he felt that life could change over a long period of time as well. So another scientist that had a pretty significant impact on the idea of evolution was a person by the name of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And Lamarck had proposed that all organisms actually have the inborn or innate urge to become more complex and actually to become more perfect. And so in other words, when we say inborn, we're talking really about something that you can't control. Now, as a result, organisms will change and actually acquire those features that will make them live much more successfully in their environment. And so in Lamarck's mind, he felt that the organism could actually change the size or the shape of their body structures or their organs. And they could do this by using the body in new ways. And you can see that over here on the right hand side. You have two groups of giraffes. And in this second group, you'll notice that we have a giraffe that is doing its best to stretch its neck and reach the leaves on the trees. Now over here on the left you have a giraffe that really isn't having to work too hard so it's not really having to stretch its neck. So in Lamarck's idea he felt that over the period of time that that animal was alive that the more times that that animal actually stretches its neck its neck would actually get longer and longer till eventually you ended up with a giraffe that had a long neck. While in this particular case, since this giraffe was not using its neck to actually stretch to reach the food, its neck pretty much stayed the same. Now, of course, today we know that Lamarck's hypothesis or idea is definitely not correct. He felt that um, this ability to stretch the neck and to make it longer, he felt that the giraffe could pass that characteristic onto its offspring. But of course, we know that's not the way things occur. And it's also been determined that there really isn't an inborn drive to be perfect in any species. And of course, as we just said, acquired traits cannot be passed on to offspring. In other words, just because the giraffe has stretched its neck, and if that neck had happened to become maybe a little bit longer, it really still cannot pass on that um, longer neck to its offspring. But even though a lot of what Lamarck had thought about was incorrect, he did recognize that there was definitely a connection between the organism's environment and its body structure. It just didn't happen the way that he thought it did. So another scientist that Darwin had actually studied when looking at the idea of how things evolve was a person by the name of Thomas Malthus. And Malthus was actually an economist. And he had noticed that humans were being born much faster than they were dying. And of course, when you have this situation occur, you have a very significant chance of overcrowding. Now, he was wondering what was actually working to keep the overcrowding from getting out of control. And so he hypothesized that there are factors in the environment, and in our case, things like war, famine, which would be lack of food, and disease that was actually being used to keep that population in check. So if you notice down here towards the bottom, we have a graph. 
and in green we have food production and this food production is steadily increasing over a period of time now in this case this is going to be the population that you see in brown and of course as the population continues to climb once we pass this green line this would indicate that overpopulation might occur but it really doesn't occur to a significant extent because again we have those factors that help to keep the population in check we have war we have famine and we have disease. As we had said, Darwin studied the work of this man and he felt that this concept applied even more to other organisms. He wasn't sure exactly how, but he was even more convinced after his studies of Malthus that species actually evolved. So the final idea that actually helped to solidify the idea that evolution actually occurs was the idea of artificial selection. And the word you really want to pay attention to here is the word artificial. In other words, we have breeders out there, whether it's plants or animals, that know that organisms definitely do vary. And this variation can definitely be passed on to the offspring. So in artificial selection, nature will provide the variation and the human gets the opportunity to select those animals that they want to bring together to produce new offspring or it could be those plants as well and we want to bring those animals or plants together because we want to make sure we get the offspring that are the most useful to us. In other words, if you look up here to the upper right, you're going to notice we have definitely two varieties of dogs. And there was a time where somebody had looked at this variety of dog that you see right here. They found characteristics in a litter of puppies, and they felt that this would be a good characteristic to sort of make sure it got passed on to the offspring. So those puppies were selected out, and those were the puppies that were used um, for breeding. Um, same thing goes for this type of dog. If you look at a chihuahua, for example, very small size, very compact. There were a few puppies that were maybe smaller than others, and the breeder definitely selected those puppies in their breeding program, and over a long period of time, we end up with a dog that looks like this. Now, Darwin felt that this variation in nature provided the raw materials for evolution. So in other words, this is something that actually happens in nature as well, only humans don't have the opportunity to make the selection. Now down here towards the bottom you can see different varieties of pigeons and these are pretty significant because actually Darwin was a breeder of pigeons and if you notice these three pigeons look very different from each other and they're different because breeders selected the characteristic that they wanted and they bred those birds together and they ended up with the outcome that you see here. So again humans were able to choose which animals or again like we said it could be plants as well to bring together to get the desired outcome. All right, so that's going to finish up our first screencast for Chapter 16. As always, it's really important for you to make sure that you complete your screencast notes before you come to class.